what workout could you possibly do that is gonna take 10 or 15 minutes off of your marathon? How much mileage would you need to add on to your training? How much harder would you need to run in order to get your muscles just stronger in order to be able to take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes off of your marathon? Now today we're talking about the biggest thing that you can do to improve your running performance. Wouldn't you think that I'm gonna tell you about a workout, a special hack that you can do, maybe glycogen loading or a new high tech kind of shoe, and we're not talking about any of those today. We're talking about the one thing that if you don't master this, you are leaving so much on the table. You're not gonna like this, but it is the truth. Are you ready? Let's go. All right, what we're talking about today is actually your body weight, more specifically excess weight that you might be carrying around due to extra body fat. Now, as a runner, you probably are relatively thin, at least compared with the average population that you see. And that's not much of a surprise because the average person in the Western world and in the United States has a BMI that's over 27, approaching 28. Now this is overweight and it's rapidly approaching obese. That's right, the average BMI in the United States is approaching obese. And so as a distance runner, one of the things that can hold you back is carrying around extra weight. Now, why is this? For every pound that you carry that is extra, you're gonna run about two and a half to even three seconds per mile slower. Now, if you're a marathoner, this is gonna add up quite a bit. That's extra weight that you're carrying and it could be from your shoes and a lot of people spend a lot of money on getting really high tech, very lightweight shoes to cut an ounce or a few ounces off of the shoe when they're carrying an extra five, 10, 15, 20 or 30 pounds on their body. I'd rather save my money where a normal shoe and lose that excess body weight because not only will you go faster because you're carrying less weight, but you're gonna have the additional advantage of the following. First is when you carry extra weight, you're more likely to get injured in your training. And that's because most injuries that happen, they're overuse injuries in running, but most overuse injuries happen because of increased ground impact forces. So if you lighten the load, then you're gonna hit the ground with less force and you're less likely to get injured. You may have seen things like the Alter G treadmill that some elite runners use. You can probably even find one of these in your local city. But the Alter G treadmill takes an injured runner and basically puts positive pressure around the lower half of their body so that they can run fast with less impact force. And so if you're coming back from a stress fracture or a foot fracture, anything like this, you can actually continue running and not have that injury risk. It essentially makes a runner way less. This is the same thing with underwater treadmills that Galen Rupp is famous for using leading up to the 2012 Olympics. He was injured. He still got in all his mileage on an underwater treadmill. Why underwater? It's because it reduces the impact when he touches the ground. It basically makes him weigh less. And so you can do the same thing. You could get on an Alter G treadmill or get a hydrostatic underwater treadmill, or you can just lose a little bit of weight. Now, a lot of people would say to you that you don't need to lose weight. There's actually like a politically correct and and kind of like poo-poo that happens when you talk about losing weight. We're not supposed to tell people that they should lose weight. And so most people are gonna be shy to even say this to you, perhaps even your doctor, your friends and family, maybe even your coach, because people can get offended if you say that you should lose some weight and they might feel bad about themselves. And most of the time, the people who you surround yourself with, they wanna say things that make you feel good because it makes for a more pleasurable social interaction, doesn't it? But the truth is that elite runners, they don't carry around extra weight. And if they did, they wouldn't be elite runners anymore. If you look at men and women at the Olympics, for example, from any of the track events, but especially as the distances get longer, look at the mile, 5K, 10K, and the marathon, especially the marathon, you're gonna find body weight going lower and lower and lower, at least as it relates to their height. And that's what BMI is. It's really a measure of how much you weigh compared with how tall you are. It's not a perfect measure for determining body fat percentage. It's not even close to perfect really, but it is an estimate that we can calculate very easily. And when you look at elite runners, men tend to get down to about 5% body fat. And women, well, arguably you could say that women should have a higher body fat than men because they have a higher essential body fat, which means the minimum amount of fat needed in order to maintain 
healthy body function. And that's because women tend to have, you know, breasts or bigger breasts than men and um, more mass around their hips and things like that. But even in elite women, you don't see this very often. So elite women actually get closer to approaching the body fat percentages of elite men, and they both get close to about 5%. But in the normal population, you could expect that a woman might get close to about 9%, and that would be equivalent to a man getting close to about 5% body fat. Now, most people are far over this, and we're talking uh, even for a man, 10% or 15% is still considered lean. And a lot of people are 20 and 25% body fat. And women, you can just basically take that and on average, you can add about 5% to what the average man is. Just average. Of course, people vary quite a bit. And this is a lot of extra weight for every pound that you carry, whether that be on your shoes or body fat, it's going to cost you two to three seconds per mile. And so I want you to take a minute right here and calculate with me your BMI. It's totally free and you can put in your height and then you can put in your weight and it'll tell you what your BMI is. And chances are, even if you're uh, a lean runner, that you're going to be somewhere around 23, 24, 25, somewhere in that range. Now, maybe you're the exception to this, but the chances are that you're above 20 and that you're above 21 and even 22. So what I want you to do is use this calculator and I want you to just guess and check until you get to a BMI of about 20. So input a weight, keep your height the same, of course, and input a weight that's five pounds or 10 pounds or 20 pounds lower and just keep hitting enter until you see that BMI number come out to about 20.0, pretty close to that. Now, whatever weight that is, that can be now it doesn't have to be you don't need to become this way i'm not telling you to to that you have to lose weight until you are that way but i'm telling you that you could lose weight down to about that body weight and you would still not be underweight you would just be on the lower range of normal how many pounds is that different from where you are right now is it five is it 10 is it 20 is it 50 <laughs> what is it and then do a quick calculation take that number and let's say it's 10 pounds. Conservatively, that's going to be 20 seconds per mile. 20 seconds per mile. Add that up over a marathon. That's every three miles. That's a minute. So that's nine and a half minutes. It's almost 10 minutes. And we're using a conservative number here that it's only 10 pounds and that it's only two seconds per mile. It's actually, actually going to be more like 15 minutes. And that's only if it's 10 pounds. Can you see how this is really impactful? What workout could you possibly do that is going to take 10 or 15 minutes off of your marathon? How much mileage would you need to add on to your training? How much harder would you need to run in order to get your muscles just stronger in order to be able to take 10 or 15 or 20 minutes off of your marathon? It's quite a bit, isn't it? Now, here's the great secret. This is a compound effect. So if you lose a little bit of body weight, it means that it takes less energy for you to move one mile or 20 miles or a marathon. So we've already talked about you're going to go faster, arguably, just because of the weight loss. But not only that, in your training, for the same energy output, for the same effort that you're putting into your training right now, you'll be able to train more miles or faster. Let's just say that it's more miles. Let's say that it's 10% or 20% more mileage that you can run at the same effort because it takes less energy to move your body when you weigh less. So that means not only will you just automatically run faster because of less body weight, but you will be able to train that much more at the same effort level. So you're going faster because you lose the weight, but you're getting more fit as well at the same time because you can train more. Now at the same time, you're also decreasing your injury risk because like I said, the injury risk is a product of how much force you hit the ground with thousands and thousands of times in a day and in a week, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of times. So if you reduce your injury risk and you can train more, well, guess what? You can train even more. You see how this just compounds? Now, one of the biggest limiting factors in your performance, not just in your training, but on race day is the temperature of the local muscle. Now, if you were to pick up a, a dumbbell in your hand and just do curls, that bicep would, uh, would start to get sore and you wouldn't be able to do any more curls and you'd have to put the weight down. 
But if you waited just a minute or two, you could pick that weight up and you could do it again. So you weren't really fatigued. You didn't use up all of your fuel in your body. What happened is the temperature inside of that muscle got high enough to where it wasn't able to contract anymore. So your ability to dissipate heat and cool down is going to be a huge determinant in how well you can run. This is why you can run faster in relatively cool temperatures. Now we're talking about anywhere from like high 40s to low 60s Fahrenheit. You'll run probably better than if the temperatures were 70, 75, or 80 degrees. There is an ideal temperature. Now, of course, if it gets too cold, well, you're going to have to wear extra clothing or you could get hypothermic. But in those cool temperatures, you will run faster. One of the reasons is because you can dissipate body heat better. You can keep those local muscles cool. So if you have extra body fat on you, not only is it going to take more energy to move it, not only does it increase your injury risk, not only does it limit the amount of training you can do, but also it limits your ability to dissipate heat. And so on race day, you get a compounded, 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 that's four effects that are going to help you run faster. Can you see how this is really powerful? Now, the final caveat here is that if you lose weight by calorie restricting, none of this is going to matter because you're going to be weak. You're going to be tired. You're going to be hangry. You're not going to have glycogen. So I don't want you to do that. But if you can reduce your body weight in a healthy way, then you get all of these benefits and you get improved health. So we now have five things that are compounding to make you a better runner. And this is how impactful this is. I have a runner whose name is Brett. I like to brag about him a lot because a lot of my runners have had quite incredible improvements in a very short period of time, but nobody quite as much as Brett. Now, Brett, he's coming up on, I think, his like 49th birthday or something. He's approaching 50. And when he came to me, he was a 358 marathoner, but he wanted to get under 305. That was his goal. And I told him, You're not going to do it unless we change your diet and we get your BMI lower. Now he did it and he lost 25 pounds. Now this guy, he wasn't obese, not at all. He was a lean runner, probably like you. And he still was able to lose 25 pounds and he's kept it off. And within just over three months, like three months in one week, we got him to a 303. We took almost an hour off of his marathon in three months. Now, most runners don't do that, do they? because they don't do the one thing that is really going to move the needle for them. We like to go to the track and do intervals. We like to do the long run because we can log it in our books and have our Strava and show it to our friends and it feels good. But the hard thing is to actually change our diet habits and to lose weight. How many people want to lose weight, but they never do? A lot of people, isn't it? So this isn't easy to do, but I am going to share with you a couple of things that can really move the needle for you. So let's take a breath together, I move into part two. Now, there is a study that was done out of New Zealand. It's called the Broad Study. We'll link it below here and you can read about it. But this is the most successful weight loss study that's ever been done. Now, there are a lot of studies where the participants have lost a lot of weight, and that's because you can calorie restrict and lose a whole bunch of weight, but then after the study's done, the weight is just going to come back and maybe then some. And so the broad study was a longitudinal study. They worked with participants for six weeks and they measured their body weight loss and it was very significant, but they came back. Now they let these people go and they came back six months later and followed up because they wanted to see how much of that weight did they regain because everybody regains the weight after these and they measured it six months and the participants continued to lose weight. So they said, wow, that's amazing. And they let them go and they came back a year later and they said, okay, well, surely they've regained some of that weight because who keeps it off for a year? And the participants had kept the weight off for a year. And so this study was really impactful. Now, what did they do? They didn't exercise. They didn't feed them any kinds of foods. All they did was provide an education. And it was, I forget how much time it was, but it was like two hours per day of education on plant-based diet. That's all they did. And then the participants were able to go do whatever they want. And they chose to eat more plants, less animal products. 
Now, this is the biggest thing that you can do in order to reduce your body weight. This is actually a giant, huge subject. I'm going to give you just a couple of bullet points. I want you to think of nutrition as a spectrum. And on one side is heavy foods, processed foods, lots of chemicals, lots of GMOs, lots of salt, lots of preservatives, lots of heavy things, lots of meat, lots of fried food, lots of cheese, lots of dairy. That's on one side. And that's, you know, away from health. And as you move towards the other side, I'm not even going to claim to know what the apex of nutrition is. But as you get closer to it, you're going to get more plants, more high water content fruit, higher fiber intake, more living foods as you get closer to that. And that's what the broad study did. The broad study just introduced whole food plant-based. It's called WFPB, whole food plant-based diets to these people. And that just means if it's a, a food that is fractionalized, like a piece of a food, like cottonseed oil or avocado oil or um, whey protein or anything like that, that's not a food. That's a fractionalized food. So a whole food would be an apple or rice or cabbage or a potato or a lentil or a banana. These are whole foods. So whole food, plant-based, because you could also eat a whole food that's an egg or a chicken, right? So whole food, plant-based, that's all they did. And the participants got to the lowest BMI and they kept it off at six months. They kept it off at 12 months. Now you can go further than this. And this is actually what I encourage you to do. I encourage you to add in more living food to your diet, living food. When you heat foods above 117 degrees, which is not that hot, you break down the proteins, you break down the enzymes and you basically kill the food. That's why you can cook food and leave it out and it'll start to rot. But if you just take an orange and leave it there or a mango and leave it there, it'll last quite a long time before it starts to decay. It's alive. So you want to maximize the living foods that you put into your body. Now, here's the bonus for you. Are you ready for this? This is not necessarily easy to do. It is simple to do. It's just making a different food choice. But the reason why most people have a lot of difficulty making dietary shifts are not because it's difficult logistically, it's because it's difficult emotionally and psychologically. We tend to crave these foods. They're highly addictive. Cooked food, salted food, chemicals in food, processed food, they're really addictive because it lights your brain up. It's salt, it's fried. But grapes don't do that. You could eat one, take it or leave it. Or you could eat a hundred, take it or leave it. They're not addictive. Now we have a lot of momentum, a lot of habits, a lot of tradition. Think of Thanksgiving dinner. Don't take away my mashed potatoes and turkey and gravy, right? So just understand that logistically, this is easy. A lot of people will say that it's too expensive to eat healthy or that they don't know where to find the food. But the truth is that things like rice, potatoes, bananas, these are the cheapest foods in the supermarket and you can find them at essentially any supermarket. So the means that you need in order to do this are actually readily available to you. You can actually save money doing this, but there's going to be a psychological component. And so I don't want you to put a standard on yourself that you need to make this huge change that is not doable because then you may not even start, but you don't even need to say no to the things that you want to have in your life. Because if you think that you're going to have to restrict something, it's not going to feel good and you're not going to want to do it. So don't restrict anything, but just add in more of the good. Because when you add in an extra one, five, 10, or 20 pieces of fruit, for example, in a day, there's just less room to have other stuff. You can still have whatever you want. This is the best suggestion that I have for you. By adding in the high water content living food, then you're also going to have a higher carbohydrate percentage coming from your calories, which means by definition, you're going to have lower fat in your diet. And this is going to be the quickest way for you to change your BMI, improve your performance, maximize your glycogen stores, and give your body and your brain everything that it needs. Give your working muscles what it needs in order to progress with your performance. So I leave you with that, my friends. I hope that you got something really useful out of this. And if you take one thing away from this, it is improve your health, improve your Uh, running performance, improve the composition of your body by simply adding in more of the good stuff and living foods, high carbohydrate, high water content, high fiber foods is a way to do this. The research backs this up definitively. We linked a couple of studies below for you if you want to read more. We'll see you on the next video. Thank you so much. Take care.